Last year, we conducted a panel discussion on how artificial intelligence will impact the future of work in AI and uh, education. And last year, we had uh, uh, Dr. Staley uh, was uh, with us as a main speaker for that discussion. And today, um, he returns to uh, you know pick up where he left off, maybe to uh, recap some of that and, and see if we can uh, move the uh, goalposts down a little further. Uh, Dr. David Staley's PhD is the Director of Humanities uh, Institute and an Associate Professor in the Department of History, Design, and Education Studies at The Ohio State University. His research interests include digital history, the philosophy of history, historical methodology, and the history and future of higher education. He has, he has published widely in print and electronically. Um, on the intersection of technology and scholarship. He is the author of Alternative Universities, Speculative Design uh, for Innovation in Higher Education, Computers, Visualization, and History, How New Technology Will Transform Our Understanding of the Past, also History and the Future Using Historical Thinking to Imagine the Future, Brain, Mind, and the Internet, A Deep History and Future, from 2011 to 2012, he served as the National Dean for General Education at uh, um, Harrison College. And from 2003 to 2008, he was the Executive Director of the American Association for History and Computing, the AAHC. He served as Professor, President of Columbus Futures, host of Creative uh, Mornings at Columbus and, and a host of, of podcasts, Voices of Excellence. In addition to his written works, Dr. Staley is writing articles and lecturing about the concerns of AI, the Columbus Dispatch, Tech, uh, see, uh, TEDx, Columbus, um, and uh, the Singular, uh, Singularity University. Uh, so let's all uh, welcome um, Dr. Staley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. And um, thank you, first of all, for the invitation to once again, uh, uh, to once again speak to the, uh, to the Northeast Ohio chapter. But I also want to uh, thank you and Tracy for your continued leadership, even in the midst of pandemic. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, from, from what I gathered last year and what I'm seeing today, this is a, a thriving chapter. And I'm, uh, I'm certain that's because of the leadership that you and Tracy uh, have been exhibiting. Uh, as Cameron indicates, uh, I, it was almost exactly a year ago. It was certainly in, in September, uh, and it was a beautiful day like this, as I recall, that I was able to drive up to, uh, to Youngstown uh, and uh, uh, be with you that day, uh, speaking about AI at the, um, at the Historical Society, as I recall, just down the street from, from Youngstown State. Uh, and uh, I would have very much liked to have been able to drive up today and meet you all face to face, but of course, uh, well, but of course, COVID-19. Uh, since, um, since March, since, since we first started to have the, uh, uh, the closings and the lockdowns here in Ohio, especially, uh, I've been spending a fair amount of my time uh, talking, about, talking about the meaning of the pandemic and especially uh, what's gonna happen next uh, around, around COVID-19. How is it gonna impact our lives? Uh, even after a vaccine is discovered, and even even as we go back to something that looks like looks like normal, um, I doubt very seriously that we're going to go back to life as it was prior to COVID-19. And I've been um, talking and writing in all sorts of venues about uh, what life after COVID-19 looks like. Before that time, I was talking about, it seemed like nothing but uh, AI. Most people were really concerned about AI. Now their concern is about COVID-19. One of the things I've been telling uh, audiences is that uh, COVID-19 has uh, accelerated some of the trends that were already present before the pandemic. And one of those most certainly uh, was um, um, automation and, um, the, uh, and the, the rise of AI. This was a um, uh, headline that appeared in Wired Magazine 
uh, back in June. But as you can see, the pandemic is propelling a new wave of automation. And again, automation, as we saw last year, uh, during the session we had, uh, uh, we had last year, AI and automation was already starting to accelerate. In some ways, COVID-19 is, um, is sort of adding, adding fuel to that fire. And in the early days of the pandemic, we saw all sorts of instances of this. Grocery stores uh, were using robots, especially with uh, UV lights, using that as a way to, um, uh, to disinfect, to clean stores. So again, replacing a human, uh, a human uh, laborer with a machine. This is at the uh, Pittsburgh uh, International Airport. Again, a similar sort of uh, device that's cleaning floors. Again, using UV and other sorts of uh, other sorts of a cleaning uh, process. Again, uh, this is an industrial robot uh, disinfecting a hospital room in Johannesburg. And again, all these images we're finding uh, during the pandemic. This is in Singapore. Maybe you've seen uh, that, uh, that, uh, that robot before. That's a, um, a Boston Dynamics uh, robot, but it's being used in parks in Singapore to uh, ensure uh, and enforce social distancing. So again, rather than having a, a human police officer or someone uh, like that patrolling this, uh, Singapore has been using, um, has been using robots. Um, not uh, uh, so. Again, these are these are these are just some of the instances we've seen during the pandemic, where we've seen more instances of robots. And then the question becomes: To what degree are they going to become more and more of a feature of our landscape? We had already seen uh, Amazon, for instance, um, making their fulfillment centers more and more automated. Uh, and during the pandemic, they certainly did hire more people. And that was certainly the case. They hired like rather, rather uh, quite a number of people for their fulfillment centers. Uh, but they were also um, working toward automating more of those processes. And there's every reason to think that that is a trend that's going to continue. What really, uh, and, and in some ways that shouldn't surprise us, uh, technology or machines have been replacing human labor since the Industrial Revolution. There's nothing sort of new or, um, or, or unusual about that. But as we said last year, that, there, that there's something quite different about this, uh, this wave of automation. And it has to do not so much with replacing human labor, but, uh, or human physical labor, but human cognitive labor. Uh, I think this group is probably uh, fairly aware of the famous uh, Go match uh, between uh, DeepMind or AlphaGo uh, and Lee Sedol, that's uh, uh, the fellow on the on the right of that photograph, is Lee Sedol, the great uh, the greatest Go player, the world champion, uh, who was dismissed rather quickly, uh, four out of five games uh, by AlphaGo. It really was uh, quite quite stunning. And as I said last year, I didn't think I'd live to see the day that a computer would be able to defeat uh, the, the the human uh, champion at Go. Uh, but in many ways, uh, the story gets even more um, uh, dynamic uh, and maybe even disquieting. So um, a couple of years after this, um, he actually announced his retirement, saying there's no point. There's no point in playing this game anymore because the best player in the world is AI. And as you can see from the quote here, he says, even if I become the number one, there's an entity that cannot be defeated. And in fact, it's not just simply that, that AlphaGo or other kinds of algorithms like this are, um, are just good or able to beat players like, uh, like, like Lee Sedol. In fact, if you look at the, at the rankings uh, that, uh, that are used for, for Go players, for chess players, uh, right now, algorithms are not just better than humans, but they're orders of magnitude better than humans. I mean, machines, I mean, al these algorithms have uh, uh, been using uh, uh, deep learning, machine learning uh, to, uh, to develop these abilities. And not only are they matching human skill, they are far surpassing it. In the domain of Go, in the, in the domain of chess, again, we're not talking about anything that looks like uh, 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 artificial general intelligence. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the holy grail, I guess, for AI researchers but we're not, we're not to that stage yet. In discrete sorts of tasks though, especially cognitive tasks, uh, AI is proving to be uh, pretty good. 
This is a, an article that appeared in the uh, Guardian uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And as you can see uh, from the headline, a robot wrote this entire article. Are you scared yet, human? And uh, as you read it, I mean, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not great prose, but it is very, very competent prose. And uh, this is, uh, again, sort of the direction where artificial intelligence seems to be heading. Um, the idea that we're going to be surrounded by lots and lots of robots, that's a possibility. My sense, though, is that we're more likely to see artificial intelligence appearing in systems around us. We'll be interacting with artificial intelligence, not with something that's embodied and something that you know, looks like a human being, but something maybe that we interact with by voice. Uh, like an Alexa. Imagine an Alexa uh, with capacities much, much greater than what an Alexa has now. There have been a number of, uh, of books that have been uh, wrestling with what the future uh, looks like, especially the future for human labor. I think I might have shared some of these books uh, last year, The Technology Trap, uh, Humans Need Not Apply. Uh, the book on the right there by, uh, by uh, Jamie Marisotis isn't out yet. It's due out October 6th. But again, you can see the theme there about human work in the age, uh, in the age of, uh, of uh, smart, uh, smart machines. Uh, and it's just sort of indicative of, of so many concerns about sort of what's next uh, for, for human work. Um, there are very few of us in higher education, and my theme of course today is uh, AI in, uh, in higher education, the implications, uh, the implications thereof. Um, but uh, the, 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 the current status is that there are very few institutions of higher learning that are thinking very deeply about the impact of artificial intelligence. This uh, poll appeared about a year ago. Uh, the Gallup organization and Northeastern University sponsored, um, uh, sponsored this, uh, this poll. Uh, and as you can see, it was, it was centered just on the US, UK and Canada. Um, but uh, they, uh, they interviewed about 10,000 people. They asked people, they wanted to know what they believed it would take to, to be prepared, what type of education is needing, who should provide it, and who should, pay for, uh, uh, who should pay for such education in an era of artificial intelligence, especially one that's having an impact on jobs. And part of the survey results is that maybe higher education in all three countries isn't quite there yet, isn't uh, up to the level where it needs to be. They, uh, meaning um, um, employers, companies, they largely indicate they are looking for employees who have both soft skills, such as an ability to work in teams and hard technical skills. And I want to come back to that in just a moment. That was one of the things that the survey revealed. But uh, here's the other thing that was maybe uh, more notable, and especially for those of us in higher education. These similarities between the three countries include a general lack of confidence in most major institutions in their societies to adequately plan for the adoption of AI. That's higher education, that's government, that's business. Perhaps most surprisingly, most of the adults in all three countries would not look to higher education for the additional skills and training they would require in response to AI adoption. And if, uh, if I'm a university president, if I'm anyone uh, looking, uh, uh, doing strategic planning for a university, that should be a cause of some concern for me. The uh, survey makes the conclusion on the right, which is maybe putting a, a brighter face on it, the current lack of confidence in institutions, the acceptance of the value of lifelong learning provides a clear opportunity for leadership in higher education. Uh, the question is, Will, uh, will high, or for leaders in higher education. The question is, will that actually come to pass? Will higher education do that? As I said, there are very few institutions that are thinking about, or at least that are talking openly about what an AI future looks like for higher education. One of the few and notable and, and particularly articulate uh, exceptions is the Northeastern president. The survey was from Northeastern. That's Joseph Ayun. Who, uh, who recently wrote Robot Proof, as you can see, Higher Education in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. And he, uh, he completely understands how higher education is, is frankly going to have to change to deal with the new realities of, uh, of, uh, of artificial intelligence 
in higher education. And if I, be, if I can be permitted to the conceit, uh, I also write uh, about uh, this in my own book, and I'll talk a, a little bit more uh, about what that might look like. Uh, but uh, since Cameron was so nice to uh, mention during my introduction, I'd like to uh, be able to put in a plug for the book here. But uh, part of what I talk about in the book is the impact of uh, AI for higher education. Uh, one of those effects, uh, and one of those ways I think that we're going to see some of the concerns of the people uh, from that survey, one of the th one of the ways in which they will uh, uh, have their have their concerns expressed in a movement that right now is being called upskilling, upskilling. So this is an article that appeared in Bloomberg. You can see from the headline something that maybe we already sort of understand. As there are more robots in uh, in business and employment, uh, that means uh, by one estimate, I think this is an IBM study, 120 million workers will need to be retrained. 120 million workers, current workers, I'm not even talking about students. Uh, we're talking about current workers are going to need to be retrained. I'm going to come back to this chart in just a little bit, but I wanted you to see that headline. One response is that some companies are turning to what's being called upskilling. This is different from reskilling. Uh, upskilling, as you can see here in the part I've highlighted, refers to the expansion of people's capabilities and employability to fulfill the talent needs of a rapidly changing economy. An upskilling initiative can take place at the level of a company, an industry, or a community. And part of the thinking here is you take, you take your existing talent pool and you develop new skills, especially higher level skills, and especially skills that better prepare them for an artificial, intel for an AI economy. But that the responsibility is falling on companies, industries, communities. What you're not seeing in that description though are uh, institutions of higher learning. There are exceptions to this. Arizona State famously, I guess about five years or so ago, struck up a partnership with, um, with uh, Starbucks. Uh, and what, uh, what uh, Starbucks has done is essentially outsourced its upskilling to Arizona State. Starbucks is paying for the tuition of their employees, but the training is, uh, the education is being carried out by uh, Arizona State. And we're starting to see more of these sorts of, uh, of these sorts of arrangements being made. Um, and this could certainly be one approach to how we will start to train people for an AI economy, that it will fall to companies to do this. Uh, a little over a year ago, Amazon had already announced that they were going to be spending $700 million, drop in the bucket for Amazon, but spending $700 million to provide upskilling training programs for about 100,000 of their employees. Uh, what was notable uh, was uh, the fact that Amazon said that, as you can see, its own post-secondary training and credentialing programs largely outside of traditional higher education will be done by them. In other words, Amazon is going to do the upskilling themselves, not in partnership with an institution of higher learning. I think that one possible future about AI and higher ed is that it is uh, companies, especially big companies like this, that get into the higher education business. We could see something like an Amazon university in the very near future. And uh, only just a couple of weeks ago, Google has already announced its plans, as you can see from the headline here, to disrupt the college degree, uh, developing their own career certificates. Uh, and I know for a lot of people, a, a, a certificate from Google uh, would have the kind of cachet and value that maybe a degree from Ohio State or Youngstown State would confer. What's not, what Google are not promising, however, is a job at Google. This is not like a coding boot camp where there's the job uh, guaranteed or nearly guaranteed at the end. And uh, I wonder if there won't be a lot of people that will, uh, that will be suckered into this thinking, uh, boy, I get a certificate at Google. That means I can go work at Google. They will no doubt hire people, but not uh, all those people. All of this, though, is by way of saying that the kind of training for an AI economy that we're talking about may not come from incumbent uh, institutions of higher learning. It could come from, uh, uh, the, um, uh, from uh, corporations, big uh, global multinationals. Um, I think that there are other possibilities for the AI economy and, uh, and especially for uh, higher education. 
And this is in my book, what I called interface university is uh, one of these sorts of instances. One of the things that, uh, that I, I, I think that the scenario that's more likely is that while AI and automation is going to replace a lot of human jobs, that the more likely scenario is that we will have to learn to perform jobs uh, in partnership with artificial intelligence, that we will work together. I, I, again, there will certainly be technological unemployment. There will certainly be people who will uh, see uh, uh, whole job categories eliminated because of automation. But there will be many, many more that will require us to work together with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, artificial intelligence. It was uh, last December I was uh, giving a talk and was given a tour of a, of a rather large research uh, laboratory and was walking through the, uh, the, chemistry, um, the, the chemistry section of this. And I was seeing the robot, oh, now they are robots, no, no quotation marks, they were robots that were in the lab uh, performing tasks, performing work, mostly in mixing chemicals and shaking them at the right time and, uh, uh, and at the right, uh, the right speed. Uh, but all of that was being done automatically. And so rather than that being given over to, a, uh, you know, to an undergrad or uh, to some sort of postdoc, all of those uh, sorts of tasks have been automated. And one of the research chemists said to me that, oh yeah, we already have artificial intelligence at work here in our lab. And in fact, one of the things that we're doing right now is training the machines to be good team players. That's almost a direct quote. Training the machines to be good team players. And in fact, I think that that's probably a more likely scenario for the future, that uh, we will work in teams and that one or more of the members of our team will be some sort of artificial intelligence that we will interact with in the same way that we would interact with any other member of the team. Uh, most of us do this to a very limited degree already. If you have an Alexa or Siri in your home, you are already sort of engaged with a, a kind of artificial intelligence as a system in your environment. When you ask Alexa to dim the lights or to schedule an appointment or to play a song or to tell you last night's basketball score, we're already sort of engaged in that sort of, uh, in that sort of interaction. There are some universities that are, that are including an Alexa uh, in, uh, in the university experience. For the most part, that's a device that allows you to, uh, you know, find out what time the, 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 the cafeteria is open or, uh, you know, the, this class schedule or something like that. In other words, the sort of things that you might have gone to a website to get information about. Uh, when is the, uh, uh, when spring break this year? Uh, it's sort of at that level. That is, uh, I think, going to change, though. And in fact, we will learn very uh, soon uh, that part of education will be how we learn to interact with and to think with Alexa, think with the artificial intelligence. Uh, and in fact, what I think will end up happening is that especially as artificial intelligence is able to provide answers, answers to questions. Again, I can, I can say to Alexa, uh, who won last night's basketball game? That is already something that is being um, uh, competed for right now behind the scenes. Uh, who is going to, uh, uh, which website is going to be able to provide that information? It's like, it's like getting to the top of a Google search. Uh, who's going to be able to provide that information? But the kinds of questions that we will ask our artificial intelligence will become more and more and more complex. Not what's the temperature, but uh, what can we do about global warming? Those sorts of questions. And that Alexa or the, uh, the, the souped up equivalent will end up being a conversation partner with us. What that means is that having the answers at ready recall uh, will soon be phased out as a model of education, which is really certainly how K through 12 education is put together. Not quite university education, but there's still some, some remnants of that. Instead, question posing becomes the new competency, which is something right now that we don't really teach or evaluate to any real extent in higher education. The ability to ask good questions, to pose questions, and to engage in a kind of conversation with Alexa. Human beings, as this slide here says, 
uh, has quest has the good questions. AI has some answers to our uh, to our questions, um, and that's uh, what I'm imagining the student here is doing: is engage in a conversation with uh, uh, with uh, with Alexa or with artificial intelligence. For those that sort of say, "Well, that's just cheating," right? That they're uh, that uh, that that in, in, in seeking out answers like that, uh, that's a form of cheating. That was the sort of thing that was said about calculators in the classroom, though, about 40 years ago. And of course, now the idea of teaching math without a calculator uh, strikes one as a little, uh, little bizarre and, so, and a little beside, a little uh, uh, backward. And uh, it strikes me this is going to be a necessary feature of higher education because this is what the nature of work is going to be. The interaction like that with artificial intelligence is going to have to be mirrored in schooling. In fact, it's where we're going to learn how to interact with, uh, with artificial intelligence. I think something else that we're going to see for higher learning, uh, for higher education, and I think for K-12 through schooling as well, is what I'm calling AI goes to school. And this is a really, really interesting sort of phenomenon. So this is a Silicon Valley firm, Good AI. And as you can see, one of their initiatives is called School for AI. And I'm really struck by how they're describing this. First of all, they use the term curriculum. Right now, the sort of highest end of sort of training for AI is through deep learning, uh, uh, which means sort of feeding AI a lot of data and having it sort of learn by processing that data. What good AI and some other companies are starting to talk about is an actual kind of curriculum, teaching skills and abilities to artificial intelligence. We subject the AI to training, is what this says. And they use, again, the term teaching the AI. Look at this bit right here that I've highlighted. We are designing our curriculum to teach the AI from the most basic rules of the world to the most complex ones up to the point where it can start learning on its own. Part of what good AI and other such companies are doing is sort of providing experiences, not just data, experiences for the AI to learn from. And of course, uh, people that have engaged in, in pedagogy and education theory have been telling us for decades that's one of the ways that children learn. This is a Montessori classroom. And right now, no one is talking about a sort of bricks and mortar Montessori classroom for artificial intelligence, at least not yet. But the direction seems to be that. I mean, if we're already talking about a curriculum, if we're already talking about providing experiences, what we're talking about is, well, it goes back to John Dewey, the relationship between experience and education. And the way that one can train an AI to do all sorts of things is to give it experiences in the same way that you would a child. Uh, Yashua Bengio has also uh, used the term curriculum learning to describe uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what he's been involved with. And he says part of the reason why we have uh, curricula uh, is that it's the same thing we do when we're six years old, right? We go, this is why we go through school and why when we're six years old, we don't go straight to university. Eventually, though, I could see something like university or stated another way that what institutions of higher learning uh, do are just simply not, uh, is to not just simply train human beings, not just simply educate human beings, but to be in the business of educating artificial intelligence. That would be a rather dramatic turn. But that a student at your college or university could just as easily be us an artificial intelligence system as it is a freshman from Medina. We also in higher education have to be open to the idea that it won't be just simply professors and researchers that will be producing knowledge, but that it's artificial intelligence that will produce knowledge. I've already given you an example at the beginning of this talk about the article, the Guardian piece that was written by, uh, by AI. We've seen uh, similar sorts of things starting to occur. Uh, algorithms that are able to summarize text, what we would call gisting, be able to read something and be able to tell you sort of the, the meaning, the gist of what the article is about. Although some would debate, can the algorithms actually talk about meaning? 
but it could probably summarize it. It could probably give you uh, something like a uh, like a Sparks Notes kind of summary of lengthy uh, lengthy amounts of text. Um, that's of course a long way from what a professor is doing. But uh, of course, in journalism, we've already seen the rise of the robot reporter. Journalism generated by machine is already reality. There's every reason to think that the uh, sports article that you read this morning was generated by artificial intelligence and not a human journalist. Or the piece that you saw in Bloomberg News about uh, the uh, Asian futures could very well have been written by artificial intelligence. Uh, and it varies, but as you can see here, roughly a third of the content published by Bloomberg News uses some form of automated technology. This is not the same thing as fake news. This isn't, this isn't, these aren't lies. These are news stories. This is journalism that's produced by artificial intelligence. And it's leading some to wonder, well, is there a future for journalists? I think there are, but in a very different sort of way. Uh, what does this mean for higher education? Uh, last, uh, sorry, April 2019, uh, uh, the publisher Springer Nature announced the fir its first machine-generated book. Now, we have to be careful about what this is. It was a, uh, an edited collection. Basically, what the AI did was um, um, went through, and I, uh, I, I forget, uh, as you can see, yes, uh, uh, latest research on lithium-ion batteries. Uh, the algorithm compiled uh, the best research in the way that an editor might, the editor of a, of a journal or the editor of some sort of collection. That was done by the artificial intelligence. Again, we're not talking about no one, AI is not going to replace the kind of research I do or the kind of research that a computer scientist uh, engages in. But in some ways, uh, maybe what we'll see are AI either assisting or producing knowledge knowledge that will be sitting next door to uh, knowledge that's produced by a human being. We could indeed see AI produced research as a regular part of the work that's done, that's accomplished by a university. And again, the interaction between human and artificial intelligence here is going to prove uh, particularly important. One of the other points that I made um, I think in last year's talk, and the sort of thing that I'd like to um, uh, also draw attention to, especially for its impacts, uh, its effects on higher education, has to do with what I call human attributes. One of the things that's becoming quite uh, uh, quite uh, clear, I won't say evidence, something that's, that's quite clear, is that artificial intelligence can uh, do a lot of things that human beings, once, that we once thought only human beings could do from, um, from um, monitoring people's social distancing in a park in Singapore to winning at Go and chess and other such games. Um, but it's also quite clear that there's lots of things that machines can't yet do. And I'm not going to make the prediction that they'll never be able to do them, but there still seems to be some time off, some ways away before they'll be able to do everything that human beings can do. Uh, this was the slide I'd mentioned before, the one that, the one that talks about uh, the need for retraining about 120 uh, million workers or something like that. Uh, what's interesting is to look at this chart over here at uh, what uh, the, I think this was a survey, uh, about the kinds of skills that are going to be necessary, that are going to be in demand. Uh, and it's mostly showing here a change between the 2016 survey and the 2018 survey. But uh, number one at the top is willingness to be flexible, agile, adaptable to change, time management, ability to work effectively in team environments, the ability to, uh, to uh, communicate effectively in a business context. The top four are all what we might call soft skills. And then you get analytic skills, business acumen, technical core capabilities. But a number of these and the ones that are rising the top are what we would traditionally sort of call soft skills. Uh, and I think that's probably a name that we're going to have to retire uh, because uh, one of the things that will become evident is that the soft skills are the things that human beings do particularly well. And if we're going to be partnering with machines, if we're going to be partnering with artificial intelligence, it's going to be, this, it's going to be those attributes 
that uh, machines are going to need from us. We've we already have seen examples of algorithms that are uh, that are producing art. Now, whether or not this is good art or not is not for me to judge. The fact that the art that's being produced by AI is being bought by collectors suggests that some people find value in it. The question becomes, is the AI engaged in creation and creativity? It can most certainly generate art, and you have examples of it right here. But is it being creative? And that's a more sort of philosophical sort of question uh, to ask. There are some, uh, both, art, both uh, cognitive scientists, artificial intelligence researchers, artists, that say, no, that's not uh, creativity. Uh, programming a, an algorithm to produce art still requires a human being to sort of provide that intention to the machine. Uh, an algorithm, uh, your Alexa does not wake up one morning and say, today I'm going to paint, or tomorrow I'm going to compose a poem. And yet that's an ability that we have. We may not be any good at it, but we have that ability. That's part of what artificial general intelligence would reveal. But it's certainly an ability to engage in creativity that uh, machines just aren't there yet. And again, that is still something of a debate. This is a book, I, I might have mentioned this book last year in my talk, but uh, it's one of the few business books that I would recommend because I find most business books to be really Harvard Business Review articles that have been puffed up into books. Uh, this one is actually quite good, and it's mostly talking about leadership uh, in corporations in an era of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's called The Mathematical Corporation. You can see the subtitle, where machine intelligence and human ingenuity achieve the impossible. Again, the idea is that it's machines and humans, it's artificial and human intelligence working together. On the left are the author's assumptions about what machines, what AI is particularly good at. But human abilities, especially from leaders, are what we see on the right. Imagining, creating, engaging in reasoning, structuring problem solving. That's another way of, using, of saying questions, asking good questions. All of the, the ones on the right are the human abilities. Uh, my sense is that one of the changes that we will see in higher education is that these unique human attributes are going to be the sorts of things that students will want to come to university to cultivate. Wonder, curiosity, imagination, play, curiosity, creativity, the ability to engage in narrative, all of these sorts of things. Right now, we don't have majors in these things. You might find examples of these spread around the, the curriculum, maybe in the humanities and the arts or something like that. But we could very well see students who come to university specifically to cultivate these kinds of abilities, because these are abilities that right now machines don't possess. And in fact, maybe I don't go to university to major in certain subjects uh, because those impart merely skills. And in fact, a lot of the skills that students are going to university to train for are precisely the sorts of things that machines are starting to replace. This is a chart that I've started using to describe the transition that's occurring in higher education. In the early part of the 20th century, um, when just before mass higher education became a reality, most students attended college or university to gain knowledge of some kind. Because I can carry a lot of knowledge around in my pocket and access it any way or in all sorts of ways, uh, it is insufficient, it's still necessary, but it's insufficient to gain knowledge when you attend a university or higher education today. Starting in about the 1960s, certainly very clearly evident by the 1980s, more and more students express the desire to go to college or university to gain skills, especially skills that would lead to a job. They say expressly that, uh, that what we're developing or what I want to develop is a set of skills. And that's in some ways where we are right now in higher education. A lot of students are looking for job training uh, and skills development. But as we've been suggesting over the last few minutes, artificial intelligence is starting to supplant a lot of those skills. And so the, uh, it is still maybe a, uh, a necessity to come to university to acquire skills, but that is going to be insufficient especially for an AI-dominated economy. What I'm calling attributes, I think, becomes the next layer 
to uh, to the reason why uh, uh, young people want to attend higher education, not just to acquire knowledge and skills, but to develop and cultivate these unique human attributes, like I've listed above. If we're going to be partnering and working together with artificial intelligence, uh, part of what we will do in, uh, uh, it is to develop uh, attributes for students. This is a, a sketch that appeared in my book. So the chapter was called uh, Interface University, and it described uh, some of the things that we've talked about here, what I think uh, the AI inf in influenced university of the future would look like. And, and I hired an artist and designer to draw sort of evocative sketches for each one of the chapters in my book. And this is the one that, uh, that we came up together called uh, Interface University. I don't know if it's going to look exactly like this, but it strikes me that uh, universities in the future are going to be educating both humans and AI together uh, in some way, in, in all sorts of complex ways. And that this is where I think higher education uh, is going to be, is going, to be uh, going over the next 10 to 15 years or so. Well, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Uh, and I know that there have already been some questions that have gone up in the, uh, in the chat box. Uh, and so uh, I'm interested in uh, your questions and your thoughts. All right, so what do you want me to do? Do you have questions? Okay, so um, obviously we're going to have questions from anybody. So do we have questions already in the chat? Do you see any, Trace? Well, people have been making comments. Just, just largely comments. I, I, I do want to start one off, though, uh, Dr. Staley. Um, part of your premise uh, was that at some point we would be, uh, you know, working in partners with the AI. And I might challenge that and, 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 and say perhaps it won't be partners with the AI, um, but it, we may be in a subordinate position. And I'll give you some examples. Um, doctors now are being forced to take the machine learning um, position on uh, um, diagnosis and uh, you know prognosis. If the machine learning says to go left and the doctor believes that you should go right, well, guess what? The hospital tells the doctor, you better go left. Um, in the predictive policing, um, like ICE and those folks that are using, um, the, the uh, computer and the AI is making certain um, decisions and law enforcement are having to go by those decisions. The, the same thing is happening in uh, the judicial system where you get sentencing guidelines and these kinds of things are starting to be driven by artificial intelligence and it's not up to the judges. You know, you better do what the uh, uh, software uh, says to do. Um, uh, I'll give you another example in, um, in the hiring process. Uh, a lot of companies are starting to use artificial intelligence decision support systems for uh, making hiring decisions and that HR director better not go against what the uh, two million dollar three million dollar software package has said to do so I, I guess I'm going to I want to throw out as the first question um, maybe it's just an ideal or even a naive uh, position for higher education to think that the relationship is going to be collaborative and a, and a co-partnership, maybe we will be working with the AI, but it's going to be clearly telling us what to do, um, and we won't have a whole bunch of say in the matter. Uh, the examples you cite are all very good ones, and in fact, we can say that um, in, in some systems and in some instances, uh, we've been subordinate to machines for long before AI. Uh, one uh, case in point would be uh, a jet fighter. Uh, a, a lot of the a lot of the decisions, a lot of what happens in a in a jet fighter, uh, is determined sort of automatically, and so much so that when there's a crash or something like this, uh, we'll oftentimes say it was pilot error. Right. The implication being that uh, it's the human being that's been causing the problem, uh, not the machine. Uh, now, there are just as many, there are others that sort of say that in the examples that you cite, for instance, uh, that that is in fact happening, uh, that, uh, that, that we have allowed 
uh, machines to make decisions that maybe should be left to human beings. That's right. And whether or not that's going to remain in place, I think, is uh, a point of is, is a point of contention. Yeah. Uh, that is certainly uh, the, the, the in, uh, 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 predictive policing and those sorts of things. Well, there's been pushback against uh, predictive policing, as, as I took uh, part of your observation to mean there. Yes. Uh, and we may find that there will be uh, laws. We may find that there will be um, uh, uh, philosophers and others that will sort of say, look, uh, this is something that needs to be more heavily regulated. The other thing is that uh, when you, when, like for instance, when we talk about what medical doctors are doing, I don't necessarily see that as subordination. One of the things that we are asking uh, algorithms to do is to look through medical images and help doctors make diagnoses. And one of the things that we've seen algorithms do is to, as, they, as they look through you know, billions of, of medical images, is that they're able to see patterns, see things that doctors uh, haven't been able to see. But that's still different from the, uh, the machine or the algorithm making the diagnosis. It's still the human being, it's still the human doctor that says, yes, that's right, uh, that in, uh, we're going to investigate that some more. Yes, that's, that's proven to be the case. I think it probably is more partnership uh, than, 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 your, than your observation might have led on. But it is, I don't think there is any doubt at all that there will be many instances where we will uh, cede uh, decision making to machines. And indeed, uh, there will be all sorts of cases where humans will be superfluous, will be redundant. Uh, I've already been talking with, uh, with, with people from a number of industries that are already sort of quietly, don't make this you know, public, they're already sort of quietly saying a lot of entry level jobs in say, I hate to say it, in accounting, for instance, a lot of entry level jobs, a lot of those are going away uh, because of artificial intelligence. It won't be a partnership, it'll be a replacement. Um, so uh, to say that there won't be technological unemployment from AI, uh, I don't think is the case. I think there's probably going to be more partnerships like we see in the case of the chemistry lab that I mentioned. We'll probably see more of those sorts of partnerships. On to the okay. next question here. What was the next question? This one. We have what? Okay, it's from Anthony H. Um, what kind of data will we generate as students for the AI to learn from? Oh boy, what an excellent question. And the argument could be made that you're already generating it, uh, and AI is already sort of learning from it, and that that's problematic. That's uh, that's problematic. And we say your data is uh, is is being used by AI in the way that data of all kinds are being collected and, and fed uh, for AI. Um, what I think might change is, well, maybe it's not data that, uh, that you'll be generating for AI. It will be um, ideas. It will be, uh, again, the con I, I use the word conversation uh, quite deliberately in the, same way that, uh, in the same way that we're having a conversation right now. Uh, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't think of this necessarily as data, uh, although I suppose in some ways it is a kind of data. Uh, I, my sense is that, uh, that we will engage in more sophisticated con uh, kinds of conversations uh, uh, than we currently do with, uh, with AI. Uh, Anthony asks a really good question. AI is not yet in a position to be able to ask really good sophisticated questions like this, uh, but maybe it will. Maybe it will someday. The point is, is that our education uh, will have to be altered to reflect this, and that maybe teaching and learning starts to look more like Socratic dialogue um, with AI. That's a good question. Okay. Okay. So here's here's. Uh, thank you for those answers. Um, let me just throw another uh, angle at you. Um, you have um, what you're talking about. In the best case scenario, what it looks like um, when AI and humans are collaboratively uh, partnered together. And I guess I'm playing a devil, devil's advocate a little bit here. What does it look like, um, um, though, in practice when it's not so successful um, uh, for, for lesser, you know, in, in medium to small size organizations that have spent, I don't know, 
uh, uh, two million, five million, ten million, a hundred million dollars on some AI system, that thing becomes the authority in the workplace simply by virtue of the investment that that organization or that company has made in that technology. When you when you stack it up against what you're paying the average worker, you know, if I pay, you know. $5 million for my uh, decision support system, and I'm paying the average worker $20 an hour, guess which one has the most value to me? And so, I, again, I'm, I'm throwing out this notion that, well, yes, in the best case scenarios, in practice, it will probably be co-equal. But when you get to the ground floor, uh, the people who partially implement AI or who poorly implement the AI or who only implement as much AI as their budgets will permit um, where they have a, a, a uh, an incomplete uh, implementation that you, you, you are likely, which will probably be the majority of the cases, you're likely to get into a situation where it's uh, the AI supplying 65, the human beings are supplying the 35 that the AI can't provide and that 35%, even though the AI can't provide it, is being considered less somehow. Like the, you know, the imagination and the wonder and the awe and those kinds of things are, will ultimately be devalued because the AI simply costs more. You know, I, I just uh, can't help but wonder, yes, I see the scenario where um, you, you're definitely gonna be working in the same place and at the same time, but is it really going to be equity there when you talk about companies who don't necessarily have the best budget or the best motives or the best intentions? You, you know what I mean. What, once that human uh, nature kicks in, you know, you're not necessarily going to have the honest and altruistic person, um, you know, uh, deploying these AI systems. So what do you think about that? Uh, it has been a truism since the Industrial Revolution that uh, if a machine uh, can do as well or better than a human being and is cheaper, technology replaces human labor every time. Uh, and there is certainly reason to believe that the same could be happening with artificial intelligence. If AI can perform a task as well or better than a human and cheaper, uh, technology will uh, artificial intelligence will replace human beings in every case. Uh, it is the logic of industri It is the logic of industrialization. One could argue it's the logic of capitalism as well. So there's a lot of assumptions built into that. Uh, will AI be as good as a human being? And as we've been saying all along, the answer is yes in certain tasks and certain abilities. Um, again, artificial intelligence is in some ways the next level of automation. Automation itself is not new. Uh, factories have been automated uh, at least since the 1980s, just to give it a, a date, at least since the 1980s. If we look at factories today, so the idea of a 30,000 person fac uh, factory, uh, you know, producing automobiles or whatever, I mean, that really is consigned to the 1950s. A factory today might consist of 300 people and for those that are talking about uh, uh, what's called Industry 4.0, IBM have been pushing this idea of Industry 4.0, maybe a factory will consist of 30 people that will be just as productive as the one that, uh, that once hired 30,000. And those 30 people are not necessarily, well, they're definitely not assembling widgets. What they're probably doing is monitoring or uh, otherwise engaged in uh, in, in sort of cognitive, cognitive work, maybe maintaining the machines. Uh, I think that there is a, a, a very, very uh, a plausible future uh, that looks much like the one that you've described, Cameron. Uh, there are those that have, and we don't have an instance of this yet, but there are those that are talking about uh, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations that would, among, uh, among other things, be run on blockchain but you can probably get a sense of what, we, what, what that organization is about. Uh, autonomous organization. Very few, if no, people involved in them. All decisions, and we've seen this, for instance, we've, we've seen some of the earliest uh, sort of experiments in this, in things like hedge funds, 
Um, you know, you, you could be a hedge fund manager and lose your job to artificial intelligence. I mean, so, so much of that uh, in that world is already highly automated. Uh, we could indeed see a future where across all sorts of industries, um, the, the enterprise is run autonomously. And if there are human beings, there are very few human beings that are involved in that work. That raises all kinds of other challenges that, uh, that we're only, only a few people have started to think about. What if there is mass uh, technological unemployment? As a society, we're just simply not prepared. Today, we're simply not prepared for that. Because of COVID-19, uh, universal basic income moved from a sort of a fringe idea uh, to something that's become much more mainstream. And in fact, the $1,200 that, uh, that, that everyone was given was an example of UBI. And there seemed to be some, some interest in the idea of UBI that just simply wasn't there. Uh, when it was debated during the Democratic uh, presidential debates and Andrew Lang Yang was, was pushing this, he was seen as sort of an, out an outlandish sort of figure. Now it's a very mainstream idea. But all of this is by way of saying, we've not really thought through the implications of mass technological unemployment. And my concern is, is that companies will make the kinds of decisions we've been talking about here, about replacing human labor with cheaper, just as good, if not better, uh, artificial or autonomous labor without any sort of uh, thought to the consequences of that. What are people going to do if so many jobs, if so many tasks have been automated? And there've been a lot of people that have been writing about that sort of scenario. But again, as a society, we haven't really thought through uh, all the all those implications. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I have another question from uh, Mega, Megan uh, uh, Stallings. Her question is, if an AI is learning from human data, wouldn't they reflect the programmer's prejudices and flaws? There's no question, Megan, and there's all sorts of evidence that that's that that's already happening. Um, that that AI has exhibited a, a exhibited uh, human prejudices. Just to take one rather notorious case, um, autonomous vehicles are 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 getting reasonably good, <laughs> in fact, pretty good at braking for pedestrians. But they're not. But they're only good, it seems, at braking for white pedestrians, not people of color. And the feeling is, is that has to do with the data that was fed into these systems. And so uh, it is absolutely the case that, uh, that AI has been learning, uh, because they're learning from us, they're learning our prejudices and flaws as well. And that leads to all sorts of questions about will AI be just as flawed and prejudiced as human beings? And that has all kinds of other kinds of consequences that very few people are sort of thinking about. So your question is an outstanding one. Okay, Dr. Staley, you're really blowing my mind. I mean, you, you brought some things I really have not thought about. I really like the diagram where you showed the knowledge, uh, skill, attributes, as far as the Thank function you. of the university. That, that was great. So my, my question is, you focus a lot on the quote, quote, soft skills, in which you can kind of debate whether you want to call it soft skills. Is that being more the purpose of the university? Uh, but the university right now, they're focusing on STEM, the science, technology, learn these very specific things so you can immediately go out and get a job. And that's very immediate, maybe for the next couple of years. How do they transition to really start focusing back on the knowledge and the soft skill attributes, the reasoning, problem solving, which they have kind of not focused on very much, that they need to go back and focus on that and still have the problem with students want a skill because they have to work. That's, a, that's an excellent question, Tracy. Uh, I think that what will have to happen in the interim is that uh, we will have to, students and higher education will have to start receiving rather direct signals from the marketplace. Um, that, um, and, and we're just not there yet. We've not, we've not seen the effects.
but it's when uh, we start to see more instances of companies that 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 are uh, replacing entry level workers with with uh, with machines or with AI. Again, in 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 fields like you know like accounting or engineering or other sorts of places. Once we start seeing that, you will start to see students that will ask, "Oh, wait a minute, what's the point of me going to university? Why why am I doing this? Why you know why, why am I?" You know, taking the time to do this. If 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 those jobs don't exist, uh, it, I think it will take that kind of signal uh, for that to happen. You know, um, I didn't realize that I was thinking about these issues in the mid 1990s, but it turns out I was, or rather, a colleague of mine was. I uh, 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 in the mid 90s, I was teaching at a small college on the Ohio River, Marietta College. I doubt anybody here has heard of Marietta College. Uh, but I had a very good colleague um, who taught uh, engineering at Marietta, and he and I uh, team taught some classes together on technology, and uh, especially the future of technology. And one of the observations, and, and this guy was brilliant. I just thought he was a brilliant guy. I hung on every word he said. One day in class, he said, um, uh, one day we are going to have to educate people for unemployment, not for employment. And I said, what'd you just say? says, we'll have to educate people for unemployment. And I said, that's just about the dumbest thing I think I've ever heard. What are you, what are you talking about? Now, <laughs> uh, almost, what, 25 years later, I'm thinking he might have been on to something. If we're going to see the kind of, uh, the potential for the kind of technological unemployment because of AI and automation, we could very well find ourselves uh, educating people for unemployment. And what that, what that means, I think, in the present context is uh, educating them uh, maybe not for, uh, not for the skills that are replicable or potentially replicable by AI, but the sorts of things that AI just can't handle right now. Uh, um, and we've, we've listed some of these here. Uh, but uh, my friend, I think, uh, in fact, I told him this a couple of years ago, you're probably a little more prescient than uh, than you realized. <laughs> I, I, we have a thank you very much. We have a question from Anthony H. that says uh, his question is: What kind of impact could AI have on an economically on economically disadvantaged societies? What an excellent question. Um, and um, so there, there, there's a number of ways to sort of say this. Um, well, so. Um, the impact um, could be similar to what we saw with the digital divide. And in some ways we still have a digital divide. So let me, let me, uh, let, let me uh, give a, a more long winded answer to what we're, uh, what, what, what's being asked here. So uh, everyone knows the concept of the digital divide, which was really sort of coined in the mid 1990s, um, especially as the World Wide web began to proliferate. And it was the notion that there were certain communities, rural communities, parts of the world uh, that were cut off or didn't have access or readily uh, ready access uh, to the internet, to the information superhighway, as it was called in the 90s. And in many ways, I think we still can talk about a digital divide. You can certainly say that, I think, about rural Ohio, where problem of, of last mile broadband service uh, is, still a, is still a huge problem. Uh, but I think in the, uh, the world of automation and AI, especially in education that we're talking about, we could see something that, uh, that I'm, and I, and I hope I'm wrong about this. I, I, I don't want you to see this as a, I'm stating a preferred future. I'm anticipating a kind of dystopian future in what I'm calling a cognitive divide. Everything that we've been talking about here assumes that higher education is about educating, training, cultivating people for an AI environment, uh, specifically being able to, to cooperate with, to partner with, to, to learn to work with artificial intelligence and the jobs and tasks that will require one to be able to interact with and converse with AI. And my concern is, is that, that, that um, like in the same way that there is so much uh, inequality in education, that we will see some that we'll see those same kinds of inequalities in uh, in AI influenced education. That some people will have the advantage of being educated for a world of sort of leadership uh, inside AI, 
and others who won't uh, or who will be uh, in, as uh, Cameron has suggested, in a more sort of subservient uh, position. Uh, but uh, in many ways, to, to go back to Anthony's question, uh, AI could exacerbate the kinds of income and economic inequalities that I think that your question is, is sort of suggesting. And again, that's a terrific question. Anthony is, uh, uh, Anthony sort of, uh, just to sort of finish his oh. thought. Uh, as an active combatant of the digital divide and a nonprofit in Youngstown, it is very active and relevant as local uh, as your neighborhood. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Anthony. Keep up the good fight. Okay, okay. Uh, James has a, a uh, let's see, this is a pretty enthralling question here. It seems like, uh, so this is from James Dietrich, it seems like we are consistently behind the curve in terms of ramification of technological change and its impact on human life. Why don't we already have a clear standard of governance or at least a consensus akin to Asimov's laws on AI that already exists and operates in the world? Do you think that points to the technological ineptitude and leadership of uh, legislators, their lack of skilled, and the lack of skilled ethicists serving government in an advisory capacity, or is it uh, due to something else? James, it's because uh, uh, people don't uh, uh, elect futurists uh, in leadership positions. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, let, let, me get, let me give you a more serious answer to a really, to a really good question. Uh, and I think a lot of the things that you list right there are, are, are certainly uh, causes of this. Uh, it's one thing for a science fiction writer like, As like Isaac Asimov to be able to uh, uh, announce his laws uh, it's another thing for Asimov to be able to influence policy. And it's that sort of divergence that I think that we're talking about here. Um, technological ineptitude and leadership of legislators, uh, I think so. I think that, uh, that, 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 that you could definitely say that. And I hope that uh, there are no legislators on the call here. Uh, but, I, but I think that there is, I think there's some truth to that. You mentioned uh, the lack of uh, ethicists serving in government. Uh, I would say not just simply in government, but uh, in, the, uh, in the companies that are developing the technologies. Uh, there, are, there are certainly companies that are hiring ethicists and that are engaged uh, in, uh, in what's called uh, responsible innovation, but those companies are the exception rather than the rule. Uh, the question becomes to what degree can can those who are thinking about these sorts of issues, uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll sort of include myself, I guess, uh, in this regard, to what degree uh, are we able to, uh, um, to what degree are we able to influence the kind of public conversation, the public discourse around these issues? But maybe even more importantly, uh, are we able to develop the forums where these ideas can have a real impact? It's one thing for you and I to have this conversation here. Uh, and even if we were face to face in Youngstown and even if there are a hundred people in the room, what sort of influence might we have? Uh, uh, in other words, what are the kinds of mechanisms and forums where those who are thinking about these issues can actually uh, influence uh, policy and change the nature of reality? Such a good question. Well, this is this is a this is the last question. I'm going to throw it at you. That uses this is very good answers. We could not have been happier, Dr. Staley, by your presentation and uh, the answers that you've given us. We, you know, we have been really, really enriched with your uh, your responses and your presentation. Very, very well done. I, I, I do want to throw one uh, parting thought at you, though, as far as um, a higher education and and uh, you know to kind of bring the the whole thing back to specifically uh, uh, the role of higher education in AI. You know, I was once told by a uh, community college professor that the difference between a vocational school and a, uh, a college or university is the, vo the vocational uh, school teaches you what you can do. And the university at, or college teaches you what you can be and who you are. Um, and, and in that regard, um, with respect to the university having a goal in teaching humans what their value 
really will be in the future of AI. I'm going to throw this example from, uh, from automation. Um, when I was coming up, a uh, bank teller used to be a pretty prestigious uh, uh, a job that you could have. And, you know, we had a great deal of respect for the human bank teller. Um, and with the advent of the ATM, right, uh, where you can do more and more and more and more and more with the ATM, now the bank tellers have become almost minimum wage, you know, uh, uh, you know, low prestige, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I went inside of the bank last year and, and the treatment of the bank tellers was just atrocious. I, I had never seen anything like that because it had been a while since I'd actually been inside of a bank. And so I can't help but wonder um, when we look at technology as it's moved forth over the industrial age, um, has it ever been a case where once the advent of technology kicks in that the value of human beings go up? It seems like we're, we're occupying smaller and smaller space in the problem solving space. Um, uh, and, you know, we're being more and more devalued. And what place, um, I, I guess, will the university have at really teaching the meaning of and the value of human life? I mean, you, you know, outside of a religious uh, a context, you know, normally you get that value of human life in, in that kind of a, kind of a world. What onus will a university have to say, here's the value of a human life relative to automation and machinery that can, at some point, do virtually uh, anything we can do? And one, one more thing, I, just to add to your slides, Tracy and I are on the side of AI where the kind of AI programming we do is all about deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, and abductive reasoning. We don't do any of the, the computation stuff, uh, the, the just the arithmetical or, or mathematics stuff. We're all on the reasoning side. So in our area of, the, of AI, um, we're already seeing the encroaching on the human reasoning process. And when you have computers, what is going to be the value of what will be a university's, uh, you know, what will be their place in teaching the value of, uh, of human life? Well, uh, thank you for that, uh, Cameron and Tracy. And uh, let me just say also that uh, I've been enriched by this, especially by the, the questions uh, that everyone has asked. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, 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 and always, always a pleasure. Uh, and maybe with any luck, uh, we can do this again next September, and we'll be able to do it face to face. Okay, so we want to thank everybody for attending the um, our uh, Dr. Staley's talk on uh, you know higher education and the impact of uh, AI. I would thank all, all for coming out and everyone for asking questions. Um, we will have a, we're going to be posting a survey uh, to get feedback uh, from the people who attended the uh, conference, you know, what things we could have done uh, differently or more, or if there are any pressing questions that someone had that they had for Dr. Staley, we might uh, gather those questions and send them to Dr. Staley in an electronic form and where he has time to uh, you know, really uh, mull it over <laughs> and th think about what, what, what the uh, response might be. So for, I know some people it's hard to think about their, you know, they're, they're just uh, uh, synthesizing um, your talk and synthesizing the information and they, it, it, it takes them a little bit longer to formulate their questions. So in that kind of situation, if we have anyone out there that um, had some burning question that they did not uh, get a chance to uh, ask or if they wanted to do a follow-up, um, please forward those questions to, to Neo ACM and we will make sure that uh, Dr. Staley gets your information or will provide some kind of format uh, form for those questions to be answered. Um, I would welcome that. Okay, great. And so with that, I'm going to say thank you, Dr. Staley.